Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the day. We come here to hear your word. Let your Holy Spirit guide us and teach us your word. Let it refresh our souls. Let it touch us. Let it transform us. We ask, Lord, for our undivided attention to your word. We ask and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning to all of you. This uh, topic is a continuation on rebuilding the altar. Now, today's topic is based on the, the Bible verse, verse, first King, chapter 18, verse 20 to 39, which we have read just now. Now, let me introduce uh, the introduction. Now, as we look into this passage, let us take time to allow the Lord to speak to our hearts and to reveal things that might not be as they ought to be, whether it be our personal, private lives, or whether it be in the life of our church. Then, let us be willing to obey the Lord and follow Him single-mindedly, as there is a great promise of His presence power and personal ministry in and through our lives. Let me share a bit on the background. Elijah was commissioned by God as a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel, as shown the beginning of in the passage, 1 Kings chapter 17. Now by the time Elijah was sent to confront Ahab, about his sin. The worship of God had largely been forsaken by the 10 northern tribes. And any altars that had been formerly built to worship God had fallen into neglect and disrepair and were thus not suitable for the offering of sacrifices to God. So as a result, when Elijah challenged Ahab, to a contest of Mount Camel between God of Israel and the false gods that were worshipped by Ahab and Jezebel, the altar that had been previously been built to God at that location had to be repaired by Elijah before he could use it to offer sacrifice to God as part of the contest. So this morning, I'd like to share with you Three points. Number one is God uses the righteous to confront sin. God confronts and often destroys people's idols. And number three, God draws these people into intercession. The point number one is God uses the righteous to confront sin. Now, there is a need to make a choice. Now, with the prophets and people assembled on the slopes of Mount Camel, what is the first thing that Elijah does? Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different op opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Now, this version is for the ESV version. They use the word limping. Limping. I find this very interesting because it actually illustrates the condition of the people. Now, the cause of this confrontation isn't a personal grudge between Elijah and the prophets of Baal or payback for the persecution of Jezebel. Now, the source of this showdown is the people's fluctuation between following the Lord and following Baal. In order to express this, Elijah used a very brilliant metaphor. How long will you go limping between two different opinions? Now, what the ESV translation uh, used opinions can be thoughts, branches, or crutches. Now, whatever it is, the point is plain. Israel will try to have it both ways to serve two masters. They are spending the time hopping, staggering between two different confessions. 
the Lord is God and Baal is God. Like a pair of crutches, they try to use this to limp through life. They can use the left crutch or the right one. First leaning on one crutch before, before transferring their trust to the other. So Elijah confronts this uncertain, uncommitted crowd and tells them it is time to make a choice and to decide who to follow. They first have to discover this one fact. Who really, who is really God? Now, this is the very most basic and yet important question that everybody could or should ask. This question takes us to the heart of God's revelation. For above all else, the Bible is God revealing himself to us. What is the first of the Ten Commandments given by the Lord to Israel? It says, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. And what is this that Moses declares to the people in Deuteronomy just before he runs through the whole of the law? No, therefore today, I lay it to your heart that the Lord God is God in heaven, above and on earth beneath. There is no other. So the central truth is that the Lord is the only true God. And this is the first thing a Christian must confess. Illustrated so well by the, even the early historical confession, the Nicene Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Every Sunday we repeat this to confirm and to, to proclaim our faith in the Lord. But Elijah is calling the people back to this confession. If the Lord is God, and yet not only that confession, but to consistently with it, if the Lord God, if the Lord is God, follow him. May we not only confess the Lord is God, but try to live consistently, consistent with our confession. Let us not waste our lives limping between two different opinions. Now, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. Either you hate the one and love the other, or you have to be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot, you cannot serve both God and money. Now, the next point is using the pattern Christ gave for church discipline. Now, how should we confront sin personally and corporately in our church? To confront sin, we must understand its contagious nature. When encouraging the Corinthians to remove an unrepentant adulterer from the church, Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little ease affects the whole batch of doubt? If the Corinthians did not confront this sin, it would, it would only spread throughout the church. Likewise, if we don't confront sin in our lives, it will spread. A little compromise leads to big compromises. If we don't confront sin in the lives even of others, it will begin to spread. Rumors will grow. Ungodly language will become normal. Dishonesty, sexual immorality, and violence will become commonplace. And if we don't understand sin's contagious nature, we might be <clears throat> tempted to leave it alone. Possibly hoping that it will go away. It won't. It will most likely just become worse. Now, to confront sin, we must remove it from our lives first before focusing on others. Now, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 to 5, Christ said, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plan in your own eye? 
How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye? But all the time there is a plank in your eye, you hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now this is a very often abused text in the church and in the world. People will say that we should never judge anything. However, this is not what Christ was teaching. He said that we must first remove the beam from our, or plank from our eye before we remove the speck from someone else's eye. Confronting sin is like doing a surgery. Now, when a doctor does a surgery, the first, he first washes his hands and makes sure that his clothing is clean so that he does not make the patient's infection worse. Likewise, if we don't take proper precautions, we can hurt someone we intend to help. A person with a plank in the eye cannot see clearly and therefore will either be too harsh in the surgery or too light. People who do not properly cleanse themselves from sin often become judgmental Pharisees that hurt others or liberals who focus on God's love and therefore never hold themselves or others to God's standard in Scripture. If we are going to confront sin, it must start with us as individuals first. To confront sin, we must be wise in confronting others by using the pattern Christ gave for church discipline. Now, during our confirmation class, we do encounter a lot of people have different beliefs. And there was one case when the person said, I want to be confirmed. Very eagerly came. And when we come to the path of sin, and when it comes to the part where you, get, you need to worship God alone and not, not no other God, the person says, I visit Bomo once a month. So I said, why? Because he said he was cursed by somebody else. So he go to the, to the Bomo and then they, they do all kinds of things and remove what needles forever. He said, so I said, you need to renounce that and come back to God and let God heal you. He said, no, 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 no. Very important. I must go once a month. I cannot. I, it's okay for me. But it's exactly what the Bible says. You worship God, you also worship other God. Hope to Him works in His life. But that cannot be. I told him, you have to renounce. You can only worship one God. If you don't, sorry, cannot confirm you. This is the standard that we have. And there are people who compromise that. So when we do confirmation, we need to really ask very, very, you know, to the heart that, that what you, why you want to be confirmed. And this is that we take it seriously because we don't want people to have a wrong idea of what is confirmation is. So here to confront sin, we must be wise in confronting others by using the pattern Christ gave for church discipline. Now, in dealing with sin in the church, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 and 17, he says, If your brother and sister sin, go, go out and point a fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others alone so that every matter will be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, Tell it to the church. If they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. We, serving the church here, we do face accusations as well. People will come to us and accuse us of being a hypocrite. I have been accused as a hypocrite. And sometimes it is a thing that we have to swallow that our life may be really a hypocrite. And we confess before God. So it is a challenge for us to do what we preach, doers of the word. But sometimes people are very harsh, they accuse us wrongly, and sometimes we have to tell them. And if they don't listen, we 
cannot help it. We just have to leave them, let the Lord touch them, let the Lord change them. Now, with that said, without confronting sin, there could be no revival in the life of the people, no renewal in a relation with God, and no proper relationship with others. The sin will continue to force to fester in that person's life and spread to others. The doubt had happened in Israel. First, a little bell worship was despised but tolerated. Then it was accepted as an alternative way of life and celebrated for diversity it brought to the community. Then it spread quickly and soon become, became the national religion. Now, if we are going to experience revival, sin must be confronted the sooner the better. Now, second point is, God confronts and always destroys people's idols. Now, confronting the people's allegiance and commitment to God. Now, in 1 King chapter 18, 25 to 29, uh, the Bible says, Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one of the booths and prepare it first. Since there are so many of you, call on the name of your God, but do not light, light the fire. So they took the booth given them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal answered us, they shouted, but there was no response. No one answered. Then they danced around the order they have made. At noon, Elijah came to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is God. Perhaps he is in deep thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they shout even louder and slash themselves with swords and spears as was their custom until their blood flowed. Midday passed and they continued the frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Now God was already doing this through the drought. Since Baal was believed to control the rain, but God was going to do this in dramatic fashion through Elijah's contest with the false prophets. When Elijah called for the prophets, he asked for both the prophets of Baal and Asherah. Asherah was supposed to be a wife of Baal and the goddess of sex and war. Israel worshipped both of them. Therefore, to make sure Israel had no doubts about who was God, Elijah stacked the deck, rigged the contest in Baal's favor. He allowed them to have the advantage, but Elijah prevailed. Now, what can we learn from this? Certainly, we must realize that this is a common thing that God does when bringing revival. He confronts people's dull idols, anything that competes for his allegiance and affection in the hearts. So how should we respond to the fact that God often confronts and destroys our idols in order to bring revival in our eyes, lives, and communities? Many years ago, I used to play golf. And I, I was so uh, obsessed with it. Every weekend, I go to play golf. I go to driving range three times a week. I was so obsessed with the equipment and all that. At the end, I said, no, that is really become my idol. It, I'm not saying that golf is not good. Huh? I'm not saying that it is good exercise. But when we become so obsessed with it, uh, every equipment I have, I check the, the degree, because one degree can cost five meters. I check all the golf club angle to make sure that I eat correctly. That is the thing that I was so involved in. But thank God I gave it up, because it really is my idol. So, we need to check ourselves. So God confronts people's idols in order to bring revival to us. So we must constantly test our own hearts to discern what may be stealing our affection and time away from God so we can repent. Proverbs 4.23 says, Guard your heart with all vigilance, for from it are source of life. 
and in Psalm 139, 30, 23, 24, David prayed, is, uh, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We must guard our hearts, our hearts against any idolatrous tendency, whether that be entertainment, career, relationships, money, sexual immorality, false teaching, or anything else. We must continually ask ourselves, are we putting anything before God and His will for our lives? Is there anything that we are putting too much time and energy into what is keeping us from reading God's word, prayer, worship with the saints and serving God? If so, we must repent by either getting rid of these things or reorganizing our time so that God is prioritized. As God told the church of Ephesus, He must be our first love, our priority, lest He remove our lampstand. We cannot have revival if we have, if they are idols in our lives, even as Israel could not. Now, because God confronts people's idols to bring revival, we must wisely and humbly confront the idols of others. With that said, said, Christ said from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Typically, a person who idealizes money and prestige will constantly talk about it. If you meet people and then their conversation, you will know what is in their heart, right? Because the things come of the heart is from, come from the mouth is from the heart. If I were to play golf a lot, I would talk about golf all the time. Because that is my, in my heart. And I would talk to people with playing golf, that's all. So typically, a person will show what he comes up from, from his heart. So a, a person who idealizes the religious works will constantly brag about them like the Pharisees. A person consumed with the physical appearance or what people think of them will constantly display it through the language and action. A person who loves comfort more than doing God's will will demonstrate that through words and actions. We can't hide what is in our heart. It will always come out. And because of this reality and because we love others, we may at times in humility need to point out things which may be hindering God's best or distracting them from God. Again, this must be done in humility because only God clearly sees the heart and our eyesight is often cloudy because of our own sin. There is an Anglican church that I learned from a priest in an offering. When they counted an the offering, they saw a 4D ticket inside the offering bag. Somebody had put the money inside. It cost one ringgit, but it can become one million. So, the pastor was like, my goodness, why they are offering this? In fact, during the Holy uh, Confirmation class, we have challenged one, one person who actually buys for digit. And that person said, it's nothing wrong. Oh, if we win the ticket, we will give the money to the church. That's what the person said. No, it is the motive. So, so when they count the offering if a four DJ, they, they joke, maybe we should wait for the opening on Monday. But will you do that? Or as a priest, you will just tear off the ticket and throw it in, in the dustbin. So that is something that is not right. We have to take the stand. We don't know who is the person, but let us not do that, okay? Now, B is restoration of, of the lost author. Now, what an important act Elijah made. Elijah teaches, teaches us that we must come to God on his terms and through his means of access. The Lord's author of sacrifice represented his prescribed means to, for access and fellowship. Not two things. One of the, of the words used for offering a sacrifice in the, in the Old Testament was 
Bhadra. He meant to come near, approach, draw near, draw near, and then to offer and bring. And another word used in Allah means literally to go up, ascend, and climb. The ascent of the smoke of the sacrifice symbolizes access to God through sacrifice that satisfied God's holiness in anticipation of the substitutionary death of His Son, Jesus. Second thing is, preparing the Lord's altar depicted coming to the Lord on His terms by repentance or confession and restoring the areas of access we have neglected as have been the case with Israel. God's altar had been neglected and was in shambles. But in his place, in this place, they have substituted the idolatrous system of Baal. But for God to hear our prayer, we need to repair or correct those things in our lives that hinder fellowship with him. In Psalm 66, 18 says, If I cherish, cherish sin in my heart, the Lord so how Elijah prepared the altar he used 12 stones by 12 Elijah was addressing Northern kingdom of the ten tribes. After Solomon, the kingdom had been divided into the southern kingdom of two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, and the northern kingdom of the remaining ten tribes. This demonstrated God had never accepted this division. And one of the things that always hinders the impact of God's people in the world is this unity. God wants his people united and working together. And number three, God draws his people into intercession. In 1 Kings 6, 18, 36, 37, it says, At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today. That you are God in Israel. I am your servant. I have done all these things at your call. Answer me, Lord. Answer me. So these people will know that you, Lord, are God. And that you're turning their hearts back again. After the false prophets prayed for approximately 12 hours, Elijah prayed a simple prayer and God brought fire from heaven, consumed the sacrifice. It must be understood that this is not just a prayer for fire from heaven. Elijah prayed that God would prove he was God so that the people would know that he was the Winning, he is winning back the allegiance. Elijah was praying for revival. As of the adulterous Israel would repent and turn back to God. So we need to commit to praying faithfully. Because intercession always and often precedes revival, we must commit to God faithfully praying for it in areas and the people that has called us, that God has called us to. Again, God sought for a person to stand in the gap and pray. But Ezekiel mentioned none. Ezekiel 22, 20 say, I look for the man from among men who repair the wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land so that I will not destroy it. But I found no one. No doubt there were a lot of believers in Israel 
or most were too busy or too concerned with the affairs to pray for the lost, repentance in the nation and others. Therefore, God destroyed the land. We must commit to praying long term for lost friends, our church, our community, and our nation because God is seeking for a washed man who will stand in the gap. We need to commit to praying corporately because intercession often precedes revival. We must also at times commit to praying for it corporately. In this text, we only see Elijah praying, but no doubt it was just a part of the faithful remnant that God has preserved who was also praying for the nation to turn back to God, including those prophets hiding in the caves. There seem to be special promises and power in corporate prayer. Though his promise is given specially to Israel, certainly it has application to the church, to us, since it reflects God's unchanging character. In 2 Chronicles 7, 13 to 15, it says, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land of, or send a plague among my people, if my people are called by my name, to humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from them. I will forgive them, heal the land. Now our eyes must be open and my ears attentive to prayers offered in this place. God told Israel that when his people humble himself in prayer, sought the Lord, turn from their sin, that God will forgive them and heal the land. Again, I tell you the truth. If two of you on earth agree about whatever you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three are answered in my name, I am there among them. There is a special power in corporate prayer because of the reality. Certainty is wise to initiate meetings for specific causes, church-wide fasting events, and corporate prayer with churches in the city. As believers humble themselves before God and agree together for things, Scripture says, God's desires like the salvation of the lost, righteousness in a nation, and the revival in the church or Christian institution. God often moves in a special way in response to the people's prayer. So in conclusion, are there areas of our life that we will have to say were worldly and abhorrent to God, maybe we would like to come to this altar and confess these sins and experience God's power in forgiveness. Are we able to see apostasy that abounds all around us? If so, maybe we would like to come and pray for churches and pray for our church that we will ever, we will ever be quick to recognize apostasy that we will make our stand for Jesus. Maybe you have never been saved, that you would like to meet this all-powerful, all-loving God. If you will come to him, he will receive you and he will save your soul if you ask him to. Whatever the need of your heart and life today, please bring it to the Lord. If the word of God touched you, we have a prayer group here. If the word today touch your heart, do not wait, do not hesitate. Make a decision. Come to God. He will pray for you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. As the Holy Spirit will continue to touch our hearts, teach us to come to draw near to you. Let it be double-edged sword that really cut through our hearts and review things that is holding us, holding us back, draw near to you. So work in our lives, Lord, we ask. 
Wir aßen bei Ort, die sind Jesus nehmen.